Um, so I am one of the physicians that um, works with this track. It's myself, Dr. Osario, and Dr. Perot. I'm sure across some point most of you have met one of the three of us. <laughs> um, today I'm going to be talking about borderline personality disorder. Um, so while not everybody in this room could be characterized or diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, um, I am going to talk about what, what that diagnosis means um, and mostly like um, how we can use that in our day-to-day -day life, whether or not I have like full-blown disorder or maybe I just have some traits that might be interpreted that way. Um, so first of all, we're going to start with what is borderline personality disorder. Has anybody in here, has anyone heard of that before? Um, so borderline personality disorder is a horrendous name. Um, it makes it sound like really terrible and miserable. It was definitely like a bunch of super old white guys in a room like, this is a really good thing to call this. Or, like, that's a horrible thing to call this. I don't know why you would ever call it that. Um, but basically, what it tells us is the only thing that personality disorders as a whole tell us as individual people is how does your brain respond to stressful situations. So if you're looking at antisocial personality disorder, avoidant, dependent, borderline, if you're looking at any of those personality disorders, um, all it is telling um, you as an individual, me as a practitioner, is how is your brain responding to stressful situations. So when I look at borderline personality disorder specifically, again, I'm not looking at how bad is this disease in somebody, right? Something becomes a disorder when it impairs your ability to function in an arena of life that you value. So if it's impairing you at home, if it's impairing you at school, if it's impairing you at work, it's impairing your relationships like that's what it becomes a disorder is that it's starting to impair in an arena of your life that you find valuable all of us are on the spectrum in terms of we all have traits of one type of personality disorder this is just how like your brain responds to stress in a certain way everybody's brain responds to stress with a particular pattern that it's developed since it was very very young when we look at borderline personality disorder again this is a hereditary hereditable disorder, meaning that this is things that gets passed on in families. This is part, it's a huge genetic predisposition. So this comes from mom and dad, this comes from grandma and grandpa. This gets passed down within families. This is a biologic brain pattern. We can put people with borderline personality disorders inside uh, what we call functional MRIs, which are these big MRIs, and then we watch the different areas of their brain light up in response to what we give them stressful situations, and we see what happens in their brain. Um, there's a very, very distinct pattern that occurs within borderline personality disorder that we can track and we see reliably over time. So this isn't like people just being crazy to be crazy. This is a brain pattern that is occurring that we can see, that we can map. So we know that this is a biologic illness that's occurring, or a biologic like, pattern that is becoming disruptive for a lot of people in a lot of ways. So it's really nice to know all of those things. The second piece is, well, what am I supposed to even do about that? Like, that's cool that it got passed on. Um, and that's cool that like you can like watch my brain light up, but what do I do with that information? Because it doesn't really matter to have that information if my life is still impaired. So what we're going to look at next is um, what is that specific brain pattern? So when I look at borderline personality disorder, um, the first thing that you're looking at is connection. So if we have borderline personality traits or if we have the disorder, what our brain is looking for more than anything is connection. So connection to human beings, sometimes dogs, sometimes cats, <laughs> but mostly connection to humans. But the types of connections that we're looking for is we want them to be safe. I can't even spell. We want to feel loved. This is what we're looking for on the constant daily basis. Our brain is in its happy place when it is safely connected to individuals. Those individuals can be anybody, so they can be spouse, they can be friends, they can be your kids, parents, I can't spell, it can be the grocer, it can be your therapist, anything. So we're constantly trying to find this connection piece. Um, the caveat is that to feel good, it has to be a safe connection. We have to feel loved. Safe connections are hard to come by because safe connections have to go both ways. You have to feel free. In order for somebody to be a safe connection for you, you have to be a relatively safe connection for that person. So finding a safe connection is very challenging, but this is what we're constantly looking for. If we are connected, 
we are in our happy place. The world's our oyster. I'm just right in the middle path. Everything's okay. Things are going great. The biggest thing that happens next is that I'm gonna sort of drop down between these two states. So if I'm connected, things are going well. I can stay at my job, I'm not lighting things on fire, I'm not burning relationships, I'm connected. Everything's okay. The problem comes when I stop being connected. So if I don't feel connected, what happens next is that I drop down into feel feeling activated or like I'm in chaos. Now the question is what makes us do this, right? Because if I'm connected and just going about my life, then why would I drop into being activated chaos? Why would I, why would my brain do this to me? That's a horrible thing for my brain to do to me, right? So the thing that make us do this are stress. And again, this is a biological reaction. We're not choosing to go from being safely and connected to our partners or to whoever to feeling like we're in activated chaos. This is just something that your brain does automatically. It does it within seconds. It does it before you're even really conscious of, of it happening. What kinds of stress happen? Well, literally anything. So this can be that I didn't take my medications in the morning. This can be that I didn't sleep very well last night. Uh, but usually the primary thing that drops us from being connected to either activated or in chaos is what we call interpersonal stress. So that's stress that happens between two people. So again, remember, one of the valuable states of, of borderline is that we're constantly seeking connection to individuals. And so usually it's that interaction with another individual or multiple individuals that sends us directly into chaos. So for instance, and a lot of times it can be stuff that's kind of sideways that we don't even really see coming. So for instance, April comes downstairs in the morning, right? She's wearing this beautiful outfit. Her partner's like, hey, April, I love that outfit, right? So there's one of two ways that April can respond to that. If she's safely connected to her person, she has a, her brain might, if we're lucky, be like, thank you. I really appreciate that compliment, right? Um, if for some reason our brain decides not to do that, because again, our brain, again, we, we watch these maps and these patterns happen in people's brains, and they're not doing it consciously. But for some reason, their brain's just like, nope, not today. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of April just saying, thank you, what she says is, oh, so you don't like it when I wear pants? <laughs> oh, so you don't like me in black? Like, what? <laughs> right? Like, our brain just goes there. It doesn't make any sense. It feels like it's a crazy person in there because you're like, you just gave me a compliment instead of saying thank you, which I know is what I should have said. What I felt inside was that you actually hate it when I wore that other outfit that I wore yesterday. Therefore, you hate me. And now I'm going to light it up because of that because that doesn't feel good inside. So I get disconnected because of whatever interpersonal stress that occurred. And again, that's usually, usually it's just another person saying words to me. They can be good words, like if they're bad words, I'm definitely getting disconnected, like high probability of getting disconnected. But also when people give me compliments, I can get disconnected, which doesn't make a lot of sense to my like rational part of my brain, like that shouldn't have happened. And it's happening anyways. So we have this thing, we're now in activated chaos, which isn't great. And what does our partner do when I react like that to a compliment? They start doing one of these, like okay. Well, I'm gonna go to work now. That was weird. <laughs> right? Or they call you crazy, or they say, What's wrong with you? Why do you always do this? I hate when you do this, blah, 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 blah. Right? So they start pulling away because they're like, I don't know what that was. I don't want to deal with that again. So I'm just gonna start walking away and call you a crazy person, get in my car, and go to work. Right? So now I'm already in activated chaos. Now my companion leaves, and they leave me alone. So I dropped down, I was connected this morning when I got dressed, and I was super proud of myself, and I looked really good. I came downstairs, they gave me a compliment, and I got activated. Wasn't supposed to do that, but that's what happened, because that's what my brain did. Um, I got activated and reacted, due to that activated state that I felt inside. I reacted to them, they didn't like it, they took off, now I feel alone. This is when things start to get messy, right? So now that I feel alone, well, now this person definitely hates me. They're definitely out with another woman. They're definitely gonna break up with me or do something, like, whatever, right? So what am I gonna do? 
Well, now I'm in super chaos, right? Now I start self-destructing. I start engaging in a lot of different self-harm behaviors. Because what happens here is that, again, our brain is constantly trying to get here. And so what we found is this fun little loophole where when I feel alone, I can quickly feel connected if I, I don't know, have sex with somebody random, or if I use alcohol, or if I start self-harming, self-harm. So if I start engaging in these behaviors, I can jump this loophole and feel connected for a moment. It's usually pretty passing. It doesn't last. It's not particularly sustainable. But I can engage in these behaviors, and I can find this little loophole where I feel connected momentarily. I usually drop down real quick because none of these are really self-sustaining like skills or tools to use, but they do help me feel connected real quick. And this is what I'm going for. This is what I'm going after, right? The other thing that we do is we might engage in suicidal thoughts. We might even engage in a suicide attempt because what happens is when we engage in these things, occasionally somebody will come and help us. So that partner that left after I yelled at them, if after they go to work, I swallow a bunch of Tylenol pills, and I call them and say I swallowed a bunch of Tylenol pills, they might actually reconnect to me. They might meet me at the hospital. They might meet me in the ER. They might come back home, ask me if I'm okay. In which case, again, I found that really great loophole to reconnect. The problem with doing that is that when we do this, we start breaking this safe connection with our loved one because we've used the loophole to reconnect to them. And that's not fair to them. They start to feel used. They start to feel like they can't trust you. Um, and it starts to ruin the safe connection that we previously had with that person. So this is all like great and like really like a huge downer <laughs> that I just came in here and told you this is what your guys' brain is doing. Not all of you, if we have borderline personality disorder or we feel like we have some of these traits, this is what our brain does, right? It just goes sideways on things. Sometimes it, it makes sense that it went sideways on it, but a lot of times it doesn't really make sense that my brain went so sideways on something. And what this does is it, draw, um, it drives a lot of people away. So people are trying to be nice or people are trying to say something or they're trying to have a relationship with you. Um, and your brain keeps going sideways on things and then we react to that like sideways space, and then it starts driving people away. And then we start engaging in this sort of loop here to get connected again really, really quickly. Um, and that damages relationships further, depending on which one of these things we choose to get connected really quickly. So when we see this, it is um, stressful for me to look at because that sucks that my brain does this, right? Again, we're not choosing for our brain to go sideways and have sideways reactions to what are essentially like compliments sometimes or just like words that come out of people's mouth. We're not choosing to do that. And your brain's going to do it anyways. Whether you want it to or not, this is how your brain is structured. This is what it does. It's constantly seeking connection. If it feels a stressor, it's going to drop down into activated chaos. What's important about this is that once we see this for what it is, once we see and understand this is what my brain is doing, I'm not choosing for my brain to do this, and it's doing it anyways, right? Once we see this, we have an idea of, okay, well, where can I intervene, and what can I do to make sure that the least amount of damage occurs from this? How do I use this to my advantage? So when we look at this, the only way to get out of feeling alone and feeling in despair is to climb up the way you got it. When you use this loophole, you're gonna ruin relationships, people aren't gonna trust you, and it's just gonna further like propagate the damage that's occurring. The loophole is not the way to feel connected. It's temporary. We have to climb up the way we came in. Climbing up the way we came in takes a long time. It sucks, it's painful, it requires a lot of distress tolerance, and it's pretty much all the skills you guys are learning here. So to climb back up from being alone, we have to use skills. To climb up from being chaotic, we have to use skills. We go from being alone to activated to being connected. We can get connected again to people, but we have to do it the way we got down. It is painful, it takes a long time, 
It takes a lot of practice, and it's way easier and faster to do this. <laughs> no matter where you are, it's way easier and faster to engage in these types of behaviors and get connected again. This part is extremely hard, and it takes a lot of time. But you're here to learn how to do those things, and that is the good part. So once we can identify, one, what does it feel like when I'm activated and chaotic? What does it feel like when I'm alone? Well, if I can identify what it feels like when I do these things, then I can start to have a plan of how do I climb back up when I feel like this, right? So if I feel activated and chaotic, what does that feel like in my body? What are the thoughts that I usually have? And then what are the skills that are the most effective for me when I feel like that? What does it feel like to be alone? We have to be able to identify these states within ourselves and then identify the skills that are effective at helping us climb back up that ladder. All right, what questions do you guys have? Or none, did I explain that perfectly? <laughs> Any questions? No? None? April? No color. Mm -hmm. Question? Uh, yeah. So, say for example, uh, when you are identifying like when you're in activated place in your chaos what skills do you think would be most helpful at that stage um so that initial feeling of being activated in chaos so i think delay distract aside is a great one mm -hmm. in that moment mm -hmm. um, so identifying that like i am in an activated state therefore making like the first thought and choice in my head may not be the correct one for the situation. It might be, that might end up being the case, right? But that's the point of the delayed distract aside, right? So if I'm feeling activated, whatever thoughts come into my head in terms of like, what should you do next right now? Um, maybe just engaging in delayed distract aside and then whatever you need to self-soothe. So it's gonna take time. We have to come down, again, we can't, we can't make these connections when we're in an activated state. Right, you can't be connected if you're activated, because if you're activated, you're going to want to burn things mm -hmm. and just light everyone around you on fire, because that just seems like the thing to do in the moment. Because we feel so chaotic, we start to just send chaos to the world. So the idea of that, I think the latest distract side is a really good one in that moment. I feel like tips in that moment. So when I feel activated, I need to calm. I need to get myself centered back so that I can make a value-based decision. Opposite action. Opposite action is also good. And when you're feeling alone, so when you're down there at the alone stage, because there is a yearning to want to be with people. Yes. So at that stage, it's really about focusing on what you can do for yourself, because it's easy to then seek out that comfort, even if it wasn't at, you know, the extreme of like a sex, you know, engagement or whatever, but maybe like how... How much do you lean on support outside of yourself when you're in alone? Yes. Before that becomes more of that codependency piece. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because when you're down there, you're feeling alone, you want to feel less alone. You want to do it in a way that's life sustaining. Yes. Right? And um, which is a really good point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, again, so we looked at this because it's helpful to have an understanding of what my brain does. When I know that this is what happens, um, then we have to figure out, A, how do I feel here, and then what skills are effective for me, right? To just move up to this next step and then keep moving up, right? So being around people might be helpful. And when I'm not in either of these states, when I'm in a connected state, then I have to have that conversation with the person that I'm going to use here, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to use someone in particular, I have to have the conversation when I'm connected that sometimes I feel really alone and really scared, and it's really hard for me to get back on track if I'm doing it all by myself. Mm -hmm. I might call you and ask if I can come to your house, sit on the couch, you do your thing, I'll be in the room because I can't do this if there's no human around me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just need people to hold space with us. Mm -hmm. They don't have to fix the problem. We have to be really clear about that because we're gonna be in this state where we might be asking them, fix the problem, fix this for me, do this for me, I really need to do this for me, I feel so miserable. But that's again, still just this. That's them doing it for you. When we're in a connected state, we need to have the conversation with our safe people of, when I'm being alone and ask for help, what I need is for you to hold space with me 
and not fix my problem. I'm going to ask you to fix my problem a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm going to need you to not do that, mm -hmm. no matter how hard I ask, because I have to climb out of it alone. I have to climb out of it on my own. I need you to be in the same space because I need that like security and support behind me, but you can't do it for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like when you guys come in and we talk about safety partner, like that would be a really good thing to consider, you know, just like who that truly is, mm -hmm. who could hold space with me, you know. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so when you're in that space of alone, um, so the, the skills to use is what you're saying is, mm -hmm. so we don't engage on the other side, mm -hmm. even though it takes us a long time, um, is to um, to find somebody in advance, you know, to yes. um, cope ahead. Mm -hmm. And the best thing, right, for yes. us is to have a friend that we can contact and let them know that we are can feel vulnerable with and let them know that that we don't want them to fix it, but we need to be in that space, but we just cannot, we just don't want to do it alone. Correct. So that we don't end up in that loop. Yes. And the other so, thing, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so that loop in those behaviors, is that also the impulsiveness? Yes. So when we're alone. Not to, because we want to connect so bad. Yes. So our body inside is wanting to connect so bad that those behaviors go into effect. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's a lot of where that impulsivity comes from when it feels like you don't have control of things. Your brain wants to connect to it, wants to feel safe again so badly. It will do whatever it needs to in that moment to feel connected again. And this is where it feels impulsive. It feels like I don't have any control. It feels like there's this whole thing that's happening to me. My brain is just like, not me in this moment. I don't really want to go have sex with that random guy, and I just did because like I had to feel connected. I don't know why that happened. Um, that's this piece. So learning what are, what are the tools that I need to move up this way so that I can actually safely connect and keep those relationships the way they need to be. And what we have to remember again is that this isn't, this is like the framework that we're gonna spend the rest of our life building off because you're gonna try that friend that you thought was a really good friend that was gonna be super safe when you were vulnerable, and then they're gonna wreck you for some reason or another. It turns out they weren't safe, right? You tried to do what was in your plan, and then it didn't go well. You're like, that person was totally safe. No, that person was not safe. That went so poorly. I was alone, and then I just went back up here because that I tried this, and it failed miserably. Thanks a lot, Dr. Turnbull, for nothing. I'm gonna go back to this, right? The idea being that this isn't simple, right? The first plan that you lay down for yourself, probably a lot of parts of it are going to fail. And then you're going to cross those things out and you're going to find the next thing and find the next thing. You're going to, over time, you're going to find the plan that does work for you. But that's a process. And on each stage, it's like a scientific test iterate process, right? You're going to try something, it's going to work or it's not going to work, right? If it doesn't work, we find out why it didn't work and then we try something new. If it works, cool, we hold on to that. Find out what about it did work, right? So those are like part of your behavior chains. When things, these things happen, we get to use all of our skills that we're learning in here to build this like brain map life plan. How do I get out of these states so that I can maintain my connections as long as possible? Oh, no, go ahead. we'll go back here first. So this is just, and again, like I said in the beginning, with the fMRIs, we watch people's brains do this. <laughs> they go from being connected, talk about their loved ones, blah, blah, blah. You throw in a stressor on them while they're in the MRI. You can watch um, what we call the amygdala. It's like a lizard brain part that um, gets really, really activated. It's a fight or flight section of your brain. You can stress them out. You can watch that part just light up. So this is happening whether you want it to or not. Um, and that's part of sort of the radical acceptance is that this is how my brain functions. I'm connected, I'm activated, I'm connected, I'm activated. I'm doing this all day long. I'm doing this like 30 times a minute. Why am I doing this? Why is everybody doing this? I don't have an answer for that. We don't have an answer for that right now, but we know that it does this. And so if we know it does it, then we can start to figure out, well, what are we gonna do about that, right? I, we can identify this in my brain structure. So what are the skills I need to have at the ready all times? Because anything, literally anything, can send me into this activated chaos state. And I have to learn to identify very, very clearly 
When am I activated? What does my heart feel like? What does my breathing feel like? What does my skin feel like? What do my eyes feel like? What does my body feel like when I'm activated? Because the second I start to feel that, I have to use the skills to get connected again. Yeah, my question was, in that alone stage, even if you don't engage in those things, mm -hmm. what, and you, you're not, and you don't have, you know, your cope ahead, but you, what is, what is the disadvantage or what would happen? So then you end up in a place where you never were able to express anything mm -hmm. and you just shut down, even though you didn't engage in those things on the side. Yeah, so staying in alone, or there's another one below it, that's despair. Okay. Um, but staying in these states for prolonged periods of time is incredibly isolating. Once we start to isolate, we start to lose our self-worth, our self-value, we don't have motivation, we don't have energy, we stop going to our job, we start hanging out with people. Um, this is like a one-way ticket to a pretty severe major depressive episode. That depression. Yeah. Like we hang out here and don't make any attempts. Maybe like we're not making impulsive attempts, which is relatively a good thing that we're not like engaging in self-harm behaviors. And we're just, we're also not making any attempts to take care of ourselves. We're going to hang out here for a while and it's like just a one-way ticket to a, a depressive episode. Anybody, but um, I have like a lot of friends. Well, not a lot, but I have a lot of people in my life who like deal with this. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of one person in specific who um, lashes out at me all the time. Mm -hmm. And like, um, she she's always like losing connection and stuff, and she does unhealthy stuff to like get it back, like the loophole, like you talked about. My question is, how responsible am I for her? If I'm her favorite person. Is it my responsibility to just put up with everything, try to get her to use her skills? I, I mean, where's the line? You know, when do I get to take care of myself too? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's really difficult. We can't like we can't be responsible for anybody, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have no control over other people. So that's probably like if it's another person, like that's probably where my responsibility stops because I, I can't actually control her, regardless of what I want or what I would hope, what I would dream for her. I can't control her. The only thing I can do is control myself. But I want to be a safe person. I don't want to be that person who like ends up like being bad or something. Like yeah, and like we also can't control like we can't control whether or not you're a safe person for her. She has to want that. Um, and like safe people are gonna for all of us are gonna have distinct roles within our life that makes them a safe person. Um, but again, that's that's going to be based on her. Like, I can want to be a safe person for this person, but every time they see me, they might like light it up. In which case, I'm not the safest person for that particular interaction. I might be safe in a different setting, a different scenario. But if they keep coming to me when they're in crisis and they just blow it up further, like I'm not the right person for that moment. So we can assist them and remind them that you know I'm not the best when you're in this state. Maybe when you're in this state. This is the place where you and I can connect. Okay. All right. So what I have are some fun handouts <laughs> where we're going to go through um, each state and we're going to start to try and identify um, like what are the different, what are my different body feelings when I'm in this state? So April's hand in the mouth. So, one side is an example that says example. The other side, this is all my beautiful hand hand drawn art. So you're welcome. Um, so under each of the things, so for connection, what you're gonna want to do is you're gonna like underneath it, I want you to write down what are some of the emotions that I feel and what are some of the physical like body sensations that I feel when I'm connected. Because the first thing we have to do, do is identify when I feel like I'm in each of these states. Because if we can't tell that I'm activated, we're going to have a really hard time using any skills because we don't actually know we're there. Sorry, I ran out of it. There's an extra one. 